It's my pleasure to introduce our final keynotes and panel of the day. This panel will be keynoted by two advocates in the fight against food waste. Rhea Su is the president of the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, and Dana Gunders is a staff scientist for the Food and Agriculture Program at NRDC. NRDC has done incredible and amazing research around food loss and food waste, including highlighting both the environmental and ep economic impact of food that is lost in fields, during transport, in restaurants, at grocery stores, and in our homes. Solutions are needed on multiple fronts, including building awareness and creating better policies. And I'm so honored that Rhea and Dana could be with us to share some really exciting news. After this dual keynote, Eliza Barclay from Vox.com will moderate the panel on innovative models for food recovery and reducing food waste. It's now my sincere pleasure to welcome Rhea and Dana to the stage. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks so much, Danielle. Um, so what an honor it is to be here at the second annual Food Tank Summit. Um, this work, your work, truly represents the cutting edge of so much of what we're about in the environmental community, and certainly in our effort to create a more just and equitable society more broadly. We at NRDC and you here at Food Tank are kindred spirits in that it has never been enough for either of us to identify problems and just simply wring our hands. We are both of us, very much focused on finding solutions that can lead us forward. And no everyday decisions of any of us makes more important uh, contributions to our health or to the health of our planet than what we eat. Food connects us to our world in a way that is unique and powerful. It connects us to our need for clean air, fresh water, and healthy lands. And it connects us to the ways the choices we make have a real impact on all of that. So I'd like to think of myself as a food waste warrior, but it's not because I work at NRDC. It's because I have a five-year-old daughter. I know if you're a parent, you have some sense of what I mean, um, spending your evenings negotiating with a kindergartner to take just two more bites of room temperature peas. Actually, the other night for me, it was uh, cucumbers. That was quite uh, the challenge. So following in the footsteps of generations of desperate American parents, maybe you've tried this argument before on your child. You shouldn't waste food because there are starving children in the world. The thing is, that's one of those little bits of advice for children that we adults fail to follow. And oh boy, are we failing. As a society, we toss an inexcusable amount of food in the trash. One third of the food produced worldwide goes uneaten. In the United States, it's even higher, 40%. And you know what? That waste does impact hungry children around the world. Let's start with climate change. Wasted food is responsible for 8% of global climate change pollution. If food waste were a country, it would presumably be a sanctuary for picky children, by the way. It would rank third in climate pollution, third in climate pollution behind China and the United States, but ahead of the European Union, Russia, and even India. The proliferation of extreme heat days linked to climate change has already reduced the production of food staples like corn and wheat both in the United States and around the world. By 2050, climate change could increase food prices as much as 84%. For families in the developing world, that would in fact mean starvation. Let's talk about water. The water used to produce uneaten food worldwide is more than triple the water consumption of the entire United States. To make matters worse, Areas that waste large amounts of food, like South Asia, already experiencing critical water shortages. The people of Kathmandu wait in line for hours for a chance to access drinking water. Politicians in Karachi warned last year that the people were on the verge of rioting over fresh water. 
So how about land use? We use almost 3.5 billion acres worth of land to produce food that no one eats. That's an area 40% larger than the United States. This all still may be pretty abstract or even distant for many of us. <clears throat> We're fortunate to never have to worry necessarily about food in this country, but we always have to remember that food is precious. Food is sacred. My father reminded me of this at every meal. As a soldier in the Korean War, my father went hungry for weeks at a time. So when our family sat down to dinner, we could see the appreciation for the food that we had. We could see the fact that my father never left a morsel of food on his plate. My parents didn't have to lecture me about starving children because they didn't have to. I hope I can pass on that respect for food, for everything that goes into food, and for everything that food does for us, not just to my daughter, but to, but to spread that respect as widely as I can. I cannot be more proud to be part of a group of environmental organizations uh, that are uh, contributing to the UN Sustainability Goal um, of targeting food waste. And I could also not be more proud to be a part of NRDC, where I believe we are at the cutting edge of this issue, specifically because of my colleague, Dana Gunders. Dana Gunders wrote a landmark report a few years ago called Wasted. That report was followed by a book called The Waste-Free Kitchen Handbook to help consumers address this problem in their own homes. That book, that work, that inspiration is fundamentally driving a new movement. As individuals, we do have the power to dramatically reduce this waste. Our choices, our conscious choices, have already changed the food world in so many ways. So here's a new wave of opportunity for us all. And with that, I have the deep pleasure of introducing the fabulous Dana Gunders. Thank you, Ria. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to do what we're about to do and unveil this campaign here at Food Tank to a bunch of food geeks like me. Um, I know you are all here because you care as much as I do about having the best food system that we can. And we see this as a core part of that. Um, I was once told a story by a woman who was raised in Hong Kong that when she was done with her meal, her aunts and uncles would inspect her bowl. And they told her that every grain of rice left in it would be a mole on the face of her future husband. <laughs> so there may be some other issues there, but <laughs> not, you know, wasting food is not one of them. That's a culture where food waste is truly unacceptable. Um, here, on the other hand, it's pretty acceptable to throw food out. Um, and when you start to unpack, and I've looked at food waste from a lot of different angles, when you start to unpack it, uh, you often wind up back at this fact that it's generally acceptable in our society to do that. It's, um, you know, it's not okay if I walk down the street and I toss half a sandwich on the sidewalk. People would look at me like I'm crazy. But if I toss that same half sandwich in a garbage can, it's, you know, more or less kind of okay. And um, that's really what we're hoping to change starting today. So this acceptance led NRDC and the Ad Council to partner up um, uh, on the campaign that you're about to see. And really, we're trying to th achieve three different things with this campaign. The first is to affect consumers directly. So we, all of us in this room, along with 300 million other Americans, collectively represent we waste more food than any other segment of the supply chain. And with this campaign, we're trying to target that waste directly. Um, but in addition, the, the expectations that we bring as consumers to the stores and the restaurants and the events that we attend, um, those expectations actually wind up driving a lot of the waste that happens in the food industry itself. And you know, you think about 
um, kind of expectations around being able to walk into a store and get any of the 50,000 items that store might sell right right until closing, you know, even if it's a hot prepared food, or just how much spaghetti should you get that's a real value, you know, for the $10 you spend on a plate of spaghetti. Um, some of those expectations are driving waste, and with this campaign, we are hoping to really shift those in a way that gives social license and respect to businesses who are trying to do things differently and trying to waste less. And lastly, um, it turns out that consumers are people. And, <laughs> right? Um, and people really seem to care about this topic once it's kind of introduced to their radar. And, you know, those people work and they go back to their jobs as teachers, as event planners, as um, a guy who stocks the produce shelf. And they, they take this message there and that's what we need because it's, it's, um, we need that ripple effect. And so we're really trying to seed that with this campaign as well. Um, so for those reasons today, we're planting that seed that we hope will grow to change just how acceptable waste is in our culture. Um, and we think we can do that because we're partnering with the Ad Council. And the Ad Council, for those of you who don't know, brought us great campaigns like Smokey the Bear and Friends Don't Let Friends Drive Drunk. And um, has been our key partner for this. This multifaceted campaign will be distributed to over 33,000 media outlets. Um, we are also going to be seeking business and municipal partners. So if you like what you see here, um, please, and have an idea as to how you can use it, please do get in touch. The average ad council campaign gets uh, um, between 20 and $30 million in donated media per year. Um, and we think that this campaign will be no different. In fact, with your help, we're hoping to blow it out of the water. Um, we were also extremely excited that Disney was willing to donate the score for the PSA you're about to see, which is Michael, you may recognize it, it's Michael Giacchino's Academy Award-winning soundtrack from the movie Up. Um, and in addition to the TV spot, you'll see out-of-home materials, which are like billboards and bus stops, um, print and web advertising, all of which are running in space entirely donated. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be a campaign without all of your social handles. So get on your phones right now and sign up for, um, well, well, we'll show you the handles at the end. Uh, <laughs> sign up for it then. And um, I just, before we do this, have to express my deepest, deepest gratitude for the hundreds and hundreds of hours that have been spent behind this um, by the Ad Council, by our ad agency, Sapient Nitro, who's done fantastic work, and by the um, really amazing communications team that we have at NRDC. So with that, after about 14 months of development, I'm very happy to present to you Save the food.
you leave the lights down. These are, these are the out of home. So these are the billboard and the bus stop. Um, type of ads will also be in print and there'll be posters if you want to put posters up anywhere. This is our what we call our gorilla stencil campaign that um, we would, of course, get the approval of <laughs> cities and such to do this. These are what they call wild postings that are hopefully, hopefully coming to a city near you soon. And this is our web page which will actually be growing quite a bit um, as time goes on. We'll be adding recipes and other features to it. So now, everyone get on your phones, get on your tweets, Twitters, and um, go to at Save the Food. We have a Facebook, a Twitter, a Instagram, a Pinterest account. Um, you can go to the web page and click on spread the word and that will actually get you access if you want to embed those videos or any of those images and on your websites or print them out and use them. Um, we've created the assets, but this is only a campaign um, if people use them and get them out there. So please um, let's, let's let everyone know across America that um, we, le we need a little more awareness so that we can waste a little less. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your moderator, Eliza Barclay, Vox.com. It's great to see a pretty robust audience still at this stage in the afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around. So I, I've been covering the food waste issue as a journalist for a few years. Um, and I, I, was, I was at NPR until pretty recently and, and wanted to share that maybe four years ago when I started hearing some of the numbers that um, that Rhea and Dana were citing, these staggering, staggering numbers about food waste in this country and worldwide. Did some stories about them. Well, people were relatively interested, but over the course of the last few, year, few years, as we did more and more stories about food waste, we really noticed a lot more residents on this issue. And it's, it's pretty fascinating that somehow, for some reason, in the last couple of years, this issue is really getting people's attention and pe getting people excited. And maybe it's because actually there's a ton of opportunity to actually do something about this particular problem. And I think we're, as we all kind of learn more about the food system, we, we see it as this super, super complex system where there's all this food moving around in all these different directions, changing hands in all these ways. And we have to actually really understand that, right, in order to do anything about it. Um, and so part of what is awesome about this panel is that we have some people here who are really tr trying to help us understand that incredibly complex system. We also have several people on this panel who are already deeply engaged with that system, trying to capture some of this food, move it around, get it to places where it can actually be utilized by consumers. Um, so I want to introduce these, this amazing panel that is I think filled with some of the brightest minds who are really innovating on food waste and seeing this issue as a truly tremendous opportunity to actually do something and avert and prevent food waste. Uh, we have Evan Lutz, who is the co-founder and CEO of Hungry Harvest. Uh, Hungry Harvest sells boxes on a weekly and bi-weekly basis of recovered organic fruits and vegetables from farms mostly in the mid-Atlantic. For every box they sell, they donate a healthy meal to one local hunger organization. 
and they've actually recovered 500,000 pounds of 600. food. 600. Oh, 600,000? As of yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to date, and they actually recently began partnering with the Baltimore Police Department, which will be delivering boxes directly to families in need. We have Regina Nordhaus, uh, Executive Director of Food Recovery Network. The Food Recovery Network is the largest student movement fighting food waste. It's focused on saving dining hall food from ending up in the trash and then giving it to those in need. It has chapters on 185 campuses and it has donated 1.2 million pounds of food and 1 million meals to partner agencies. Roger Gordon is the founder of Food Cowboy. And Food Cowboy is focused on commercial food waste um, and sees it as an information and logistics problem. Food Cowboy has developed mobile technology and social media solutions that allow food companies to reduce waste in their supply chains and partner with customers also to fight hunger. Patrick O'Neill is CEO of Amp Your Good. Uh, food drives, of course, are a very important source of food for hunger organizations but most of what's donated is processed, canned goods. Um, Amp Your Good has a new technology that's designed to enable people to donate the kind of food that people struggling with food insecurity really need, fruits and vegetables and other healthy food. Nancy Roman is president and CEO of the Capital Area Food Bank. It is the largest organization in the Washington metro area working to solve hunger and health issues. So, sorry, hunger and the health issues that so often accompany it, chronic undernutrition, heart disease, and obesity. It serves 12% of the region's population. And Rihanna Lin is co-founder and CEO of Food Trace. Food Trace helps businesses manage and visualize their supply chains with maps and a variety of other tools. Okay, so we're gonna dive into discussion here. Um, farms. Farms are actually the number one place where the surplus food we produce is going to waste. I mean, of course, this food that's on the farms is very, very perishable. So if we want to recover it and we wanted to get it to people who eat it, we, who will eat it, we have to move pretty quickly on it. Evan, you're, work, you're working directly with farmers to capture produce that they wouldn't have necessarily sold. So do you think that this, avert, this approach to averting food waste has to be a local Local one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, unfortunately, it's, it's, not a, it's not just a local issue of, of food going to waste on different farms, right? So our model, we recover surplus produce from local farms, mainly local farms throughout the, 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 the growing season, and wholesalers and farms that are a little bit farther away, like California and Florida and Georgia, during the non-growing season around the Mid-Atlantic, because for you know, five months of the year, it's really cold. Um, and, and nothing really grows, right? And so we place a higher priority on making sure that food does not go to waste rather than it exclusively being local. Because unfortunately, it's, it's not just a local problem, it's a global problem, right? And it's happening every single place in the country. And, and we've called farmers, you know, we have, we have one person on our team that's just, their full-time job is just to go around and call different farmers and associations and growers and make sure that, uh, that they know our mission and their inner network and they can can call us at any time and say, we've got this, we've got you know, uh, two, two pallets of apples that are undersized, and we have, we're, gonna, we're gonna throw them away. So you know, we make sure that uh, we can purchase them from farms no matter where they are. You know, we try to source locally as possible, but um, you know, it's not just a local issue, it's, it's, it's global, and it's especially across the United States. And Nancy, you're also working a lot with farms. Where do you think there is even more opportunity to, to rescue more of the food that's, that could be going to waste on farms and get it to people like the ones you're serving? Well, one of the things we've done is um, we developed a fruit and vegetables fund. So the Capital Area Food Bank is an organization where um, feeding 540,000 people all in and around Washington, D.C. And we're moving 45 million pounds of food. Um, about a third of that is fresh fruits and vegetables. And when I came three years ago to the food bank, um, we weren't sourcing any of it locally. And so we decided, you know, how, you know, there are rules around food banks too about how far you can go and source. But luckily we have states nearby, Virginia, Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, where we have lots of farm country. And um, so we have gone to farmers and just said, hey, 
Um, we'll put a bid, you can plant low cross food, and we've, at, we've to, said to these farmers, any seconds markets, we're very interested in developing. I mean, you all know about the, you know, the ugly fruit, the ugly vegetable, we're very open to that. One of the challenges <coughs> in really developing that as much as it can be developed is that it's often cheaper that for them to plow it under than even to sell it at low cost. And so, you know, we've been engaged in those kinds of conversations. And, and what, what do you think is the answer there, that we need, we need better logistics? And maybe, Roger, you want to jump in here. We need more people who can actually truck and ship that food to make it worth it somehow. And I mean, and how did the economics of that work out? The economics of this. Uh, food companies throw away more food in 19 days than they donate to food banks all year. A lot of that is because the logistics, the infrastructure, isn't there to connect the farms to the, to the companies and then from the companies to the charities. We don't really see a solution for uh, pre-harvest waste. If the product is in the ground and can't be sold, uh, you've got to pay somebody to harvest it. You've got to get it to a packing house, a cooling house, a transportation company, distribution center, and then from there on. Um, we can interdict waste that's already in motion. So food that's gotten out of the fields and can't get around labor costs, uh, but once it's in motion, then we're looking at marginal cost versus marginal revenue. And with tax deductions and, and, and tax benefits we can talk about later, uh, we can make that equation work. So we can pay to route it from uh, whatever truck or distribution center it's at to a local charity with some mobile technology that does the matching. And Regina, you have mostly worked uh, with the food that's in the dining halls, but you actually have a gleaning program, too. So maybe some of these college students could be out there Absolutely. picking the food that <laughs> otherwise would get plowed under. Absolutely. Actually, our second chapter um, at Brown University, not too long ago, they gleaned over 10,000 pounds of apples. It was incredible. And then they had a lot of fun with their, their dining services to figure out different things that they could do with those apples. So they, in that instance, they actually kept it within um, the university. But yeah, we would love to. <laughs> and, and, and is that something that um, farmers are open to? I mean, I, I, can, I can imagine a, a community service project or even a, a job, right, of college students going out to farms, picking food, being an extra set of hands. And, and I mean, are, are farmers receptive to that? Absolutely. I, I mean, as I think has been said throughout um, today, people, you know, don't want to grow food, they don't want to prepare food, and then just throw it away. I mean, that takes a lot of, takes a lot of love, it's a lot of community. And so farmers are really receptive to having people support them and making sure that the food gets to the, to the right hands, those in need, other customers. Um, and, you know, in fact, I was talking to um, a woman who had the opportunity to go to a, a farm that was um, growing lettuce. And she said you basically couldn't tell the difference between the side of the field that had been harvested and the ones that hadn't because they had to leave so much of the lettuce behind. And I know some farms are starting to do a two-pick system where if you're picking the, you know, the hearts of romaine, might as well just leave, um, put the other leaves that you can't grow in a box at the same time so one can go off one way to the grocery stores and the others can go another way. But you know, bottom line too, grocery stores with farmers, um, there are markets for that, and it's just so wonderful to see in this panel, I think it's a representation of that, that there, there are many customers, um, whatever part of the supply chain there is, and if there is surplus um, that's prepared, um, Food Recovery Network is, um, we're, we're geared to, to take that. And actually, I have to give a shout out to my Carlton crew over here who recovered the food from our lunch today. So it went to a church in, in Maryland right after we were done with lunch. So thank you, guys. <laughs> And the, the, the supply chain has come up a number of times, and it, and it is so key to this whole conversation, understanding it, changing it. Um, and Rihanna, your, your technology is actually helping to map that supply chain, because how can we really understand it if we can't see it? Uh, and so what are, what are your clients learning about their own supply chains through the technology that you've developed? 
Right, no, definitely. Um, when we think about uh, small uh, farmers and artisans, they deserve enterprise software and technology solutions too. And so we, we go out and think about the different technology tools, especially the, the mapping and kind of understanding where their uh, produce and where their products are ending up. And they're really able to um, decrease waste because they understand a little bit more about what their customer reception is and, and how they can route different ways. As you said, Roger, uh, understanding your supply chain more as, a, as an entrepreneur can really help you decrease waste when you're sending out to better, to better places. And, and um, as we've found with a lot of our clients is that uh, they love the insights that they get from this. They love to use technology that um, doesn't take up too much of their day. And so if we continue to bridge those gaps with technology for these companies, then we can solve a, a lot of problems through, through those tools. What, what would be an example? Do you have a story of one of your clients who actually was able to reduce some of the... Sure, the yeah. Things? I have a... a we, we often use the story of a, a, a young woman um, in Chicago who, we're, we're based in Chicago and San Francisco. Um, I'm also a, an entrepreneur in residence at Google, so we get a lot of great mapping tools to integrate into the system. And um, we, we have a young woman that was, uh, went from six uh, Whole Foods stores to, to over 30 in, in a very short period of time, uh, selling vegan meals uh, local, locally produced uh, vegan meals and um, she had about 10 stores that were throwing away items uh, on a weekly basis. Probably, uh, I would say, over 70 meals a week were being thrown away. That and, must have and been heartbreaking. Once, yes, and, and to uh, losing a lot of profits um, with the great opportunity at Bay. And so we uh, set out to kind of map out her supply chain a little bit better. Uh, she could reroute the distribution as well as understand where some stores had had better had better outcomes and so uh, now she, she's doing really well uh, in several international airports uh, expanding to uh, four cities four more cities uh, in the next few months and so she's just been really happy with the outcomes great and and that's that's an interesting example of, of somebody who's actually able to find savings in tackling food waste, yes. but for lots of other players in this in this domain, I mean, it, 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 the costs of actually trying to move food around are can be prohibitive, right? There is food, perhaps, that's available that could be averted from waste, that could be consumed by people, but actually moving it from place to place is extremely expensive. Roger, you've thought a lot about this. You have some ideas on how we could actually uh, how companies could actually come up with the money to pay for more trucks, more coolers, more facilities to capture that food that is being wasted. Right, so the entire food sector is about one and a half trillion dollars. It's about 8% of the US economy. If you think about the amount of food that's uh, wasted, you've got to, you see the scale of the problem in the investment. Food banks, about 300 major food banks, $10 million balance sheet, it's about $3 billion total for the sector, which is, which is tiny. Um, what you need to do is invest much, much greater in detail. For example, uh, the food industry works 24-7, 365, rain or shine. Food banks rarely have the ability to, or the, the funds to operate seven days a week, uh, more than maybe 12 hours a day. That mismatch makes it almost impossible to donate significant amounts of food. Uh, Congress just passed, though, the appropriations bill, which raised the, uh, the tax benefits for donating food. It used to be quite a complicated formula, and it was quite inconsistent, and we couldn't get anyone to adopt it. But uh, Paul Ryan, you know, he, he grabbed this little bill that was sitting there uh, going nowhere, and he said, uh, let's, let's, let's make it really, really easy for growers to donate food. So now they can deduct 37.5 cents on the dollar of the fair market value of any deductions that they, of any food that they donate. So you, uh, you give away $100 worth of food, you can reduce your taxable income by 37.5 cents. We take 15% of that uh, for Food Cowboy, and uh, two-thirds of that, 10%, goes to Food Cowboy Foundation. And we use that money to pay the food banks to come and move the food. Uh, it works out to something like, for high-value produce, maybe $60 per, uh, per, per pallet. And that's, that's begin, you know, put together a few pallets, that's enough to get out of bed and get a truck moving, uh, which is it's a fairly expensive thing to do. Uh, and the rest of the other part of the money goes to do things like build, buy trucks and coolers and, and so forth. 
And, and so, you, but you think that at a national level, we could be incentivizing lots of people, right, with, with tax benefits to actually move food, more of the food that is currently wasted to people who would eat it. Right. So uh, I think Pat will talk about the, the last mile problem. How do you get food from where it is to where it needs to be? If it's in a truck, it's actually fairly cheap. Uh, and people talk about local produce, but, you know, a low sulfur diesel uh, big rig moving 40,000 pounds of fresh produce is probably spinning out less sulfur than a 20-foot 20, uh, 20 truck going, uh, going a few hundred miles. But you can take part of those tax deductions and also uh, use some mobile technology to uh, pay for that movement. For example, we've, we've moved food with Uber in New York City uh, because the, the numbers worked out. Um, but what we need is a, a lot more different uh, players innovating very, very rapidly if we're going to solve the problem. Nancy, you're very familiar with these kinds of logistical challenges, right, of, of moving, moving food around um, and, and getting enough. And you work with all kinds of different people, man, farmers, as we talked about, but also retailers and food manufacturers who are donating lots of food. Um, and, and of course, there's, there's tremendous generosity in those relationships, but you also are up against a, another kind of tricky problem, which is that some of the food that is donated by manufacturers or retailers is actually pretty unhealthy. Um, it's, it might be, maybe in the past, you actually told me recently that you don't accept soda anymore, which you used to. And maybe uh, one of your colleagues mentioned that you were getting a, just a huge quantity of sheet cakes, <laughs> more sheet cakes than, than you wanted. But that's what was available. That's what retailer wanted to give you. Um, so so how, do you, how do you kind of talk to these, these donors about this issue of actual, because in, uh, you could look at it the other way, that it's, it's actually an overproduction problem, right? They're baking too many sheet, sheet cakes or producing too many snacks, thus they have extras, thus they can donate them. But that's also not the food that really anybody necessarily wants anymore, and, and particularly not you working on the hunger issues. So. I'm not sure. Okay. There you are. There you go. Um, well, I'm glad you raised our biggest challenge, even before I got to talk about our innovations, but you might be more interested in that. Um, you know, food banks have changed a lot. You know, we, we came up in the 70s, um, you know, at a time when food stamps were cut, and the idea that we were emergency food um, when somebody got laid off or, or temporarily needed some assistance. And really what's happened is, we are providing food to 12% of this region's population, more than half a million people. And so when you hear those numbers, you have a moral imperative really to be thinking about the diet-related disease, diabetes and heart disease. So at the Capital Area Food Bank, we've been super focused on nutrition. So when I came three years ago, one of the first things I realized we needed to do was really address our own food supply. And it is challenging because a good port, we do spend, so of our total food supply, about one third of all we deliver is fresh fruits and vegetables, and most of those we purchase. Um, we fundraise and we purchase. Um, but we're fortunate to be the beneficiary of lots of donations from big retailers, Whole Foods, you know, Mom's Organic Market, Safeway, Harris Teeter, um, Giant Foods. And like you can imagine, you've been in the grocery store, so you, you get a lot of great stuff, but you get a lot of stuff that isn't so great. One day, early on in, in my job, I was walking through the warehouse, and it was just the incredibly exploding warehouse of sheet cake, and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and I said, what in the world is going on? And they said, well, Nancy, you, you know, you said you didn't want us to be distributing more than this small percentage of snacks, you know, on, a, on any given drop. And I realized, oh my gosh, that's the consequence of really limiting our snacks as they're building up internally. So I thought, gosh, we gotta find out where they're coming from. And I actually have our primary supplier's permission to tell this story. We were getting a lot of sheet cake from Shopper's Food Warehouse. And so I, I sat down and I wrote a letter and I said, you know, I described the problem and Bob Gleason, the regional president, called and said, can you come visit? So, you know, I went right over. And he said, look, we don't want to be giving you more sheet cake than you can use. 
Um, so he sent his director of operations out and they began sorting out all the bakery product. And I suddenly realized that part of what we need to do is move upstream um, in sort of solving some of these problems. I was so moved by the ad councils thing that I was like practically weeping backstage as I was craning to see it. Um, but 19% of produce is, is wasted at the household level and we do have to work on that. But there's so much energy and passion around that. You know, people in this room are doing that and there's lots of energy. But the hard part is upstream because it's the old graham crackers and the old Twinkies and the old Ho-Hos and the old Ding Dongs and the old leftover Halloween candy and the old that you know, can get donated and distributed to low-income people and it's absolutely affecting people's health. So what we're doing is we have, we've really entered a campaign and I have to say there's some great leadership. We, we've written to our retailers and we're saying, we're no longer taking, well, we don't take full calorie soda now, but we're saying we're no longer taking bakery items. We're no longer taking leftover Halloween candy, leftover Easter candy, leftover Christmas candy. Left, can't believe how much ho ho holiday candy there is. Um, we're no longer taking these things and we're challenging them. You help us. Because I think part of what has to happen is raising the awareness that there's overproduction happening upstream that affects everybody. And it's so low cost, you know, because of um, how inexpensive it is to produce refined, you know, carbohydrates and sugary snacks. There's a lot of oversupply of that. So it's really something we have to talk about and think about. And, and we're really at the forefront of that. So I'd really challenge anyone in the audience who wants to help me on this to, um, you know, all my Twitter stuff is in the material because this is a real um, priority for us. Yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating angle on, on food waste that, um, that some of it is just at all this excess that could be, could be eliminated, perhaps. Um, Patrick, I know you have a lot of thoughts, too, on food that's being donated to hunger organizations and that oftentimes it isn't so healthy. And so tell us a little bit about how you came up with your philosophy to help people who wanted to donate in food drives donate much healthier options. Sure. Well, there are some parallels to what we've been discussing so far because it's really an upstream problem, as Nancy's describing. <clears throat> Each year, uh, somewhere between 75 and 100 million people donate food to food drives. And there are millions of food drives that a whole variety of organizations sponsor, little ones, uh, big ones. And the way that uh, most food drives work, uh, most people would be familiar with, there's a collection box someplace and uh, people bring canned goods to put into that collection box. And the way that it uh, traditionally works is that uh, people are sort of left to themselves in terms of what it is that they're going to bring to that collection box. If they're pressed for time, they may not make it to a supermarket to buy food. They may go into their pantry and grab some food that they perhaps decided not to eat for a few years uh, and under the idea of maybe somebody else will uh, eat that. And the burden that that creates on the uh, food drive system, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a food bank or a food pantry, is that you have people out there that want to help you, but whether or not they're helping you with the things you actually need is not something you get to figure out until the food comes and you can inventory it and uh, pick out the things you can use and, and unfortunately throw out the rest. <clears throat> So our idea was essentially to uh, reverse engineer the information flow uh, and create a platform that uh, is similar to crowdfunding that organizations can use to run uh, online food drives that uh, provides an ability for people to make food choices to donate that match what the hunger organization that they're trying to support needs. And uh, one of the choices that most hunger organizations are uh, looking for and they're trying to grow are uh, fruits and vegetables. So our system enables people to donate uh, healthier food items uh, compared to what they traditionally might donate, which are unfortunately fairly often highly processed kinds of food, uh, which again, as Nancy pointed out, uh, the, the uh, food insecure population suffers from very, very high rates of diet related conditions. And so these, all of us who donate to food drives with the best of intentions oftentimes are donating food that's adverse to the good intention that we have. Uh, so I, I think that um, by using uh, 
uh, information technology to uh, assist people in making good choices. Uh, we're uh, channeling uh, lots of good intentions that are getting otherwise wasted to uh, get the right kind of food and, uh, and, and as a byproduct of that, cutting down on the food waste at the pantry or hunger organization level. And so, and so how does it work? If I'm, if I'm using your platform and I'm participating in a food drive, how would I be, be able to send fresh fruits and vegetables to a charity? Sure, and that's, that's a great question. So, um, uh, so the organizer of the drive uh, provides us with some information and we set up the drive on our platform, very similar to a, a crowdfunding site. And when they reach out to their community to announce the food drive, instead of telling people where the collection box is, they direct them to the web page that represents the drive. And when people get there, uh, if they're inclined to make a donation, uh, they hit a donate button, and up pops a bunch of food items that they can then shop for and uh, pick out and purchase, uh, whether they're fruits and vegetables or other items. And, and you wind up donating the food by going through a very typical uh, e-commerce uh, purchasing process. And then when the drive is over, uh, we take all of the items that people have uh, bought for the purpose of donating, and we coordinate with one of our suppliers who actually uh, has the food to make the delivery of all that food on a planned basis to that food pantry or soup kitchen or food bank. So uh, they know when the food is arriving, uh, they know in advance what's uh, coming, and they know that all the food is matching what they have said that they are looking for. And are those suppliers retailers, or who, who are they? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're generally working with the uh, existing wholesale supply distribution system. Um, that does include uh, uh, food hubs and other more locally uh, uh, sourced uh, food aggregators. Um, and uh, just one example, uh, we have a, uh, an organization in North Carolina, and I'll, I'll connect this to the great video that uh, ran just before we came out here, where uh, a, a group has uh, partnered with the hospital system and a few others to conduct a strawberry drive. And so people are able to uh, buy strawberries on our platform that are uh, being harvested from a local farm. And so the strawberries are going to go from the local farm right to a local, actually a set of local hunger organizations uh, as, a, as a perfect match and, and really local supporting local. And, and so we've talked a little bit now about um, how we can think about perhaps limiting some of the, the food that's produced in the first place to limit food waste. And Regina, I'm wondering if, as, as you and your chapters have you know, talked closely to the, the people running the dining halls on campus, as you point out to them how much, or you demonstrate how much food is actually wasted, are you also seeing over time that they end up cooking less food um, because it's so much of it is, is not consumed? Or, or is it that now that you actually donate it, that it's still the same? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I'm really happy to say that once our dining service providers realize that they are consistently overproducing, they do make those adjustments and they um, order less food and they um, produce or uh, cook less food. And that's wonderful. And from, from our standpoint at Food Recovery Network, we do want to reduce um, food waste at the source. And the benefit we always say is I mean, you're working with college students, um, so it's really positive community building within the university where it's being driven by the students. They don't want to see this waste happening, um, but also it supports the bottom line of um, the dining managers where they are saving money because they are not um, overproducing, uh, over ordering the food. They're also saving on their uh, waste hauling fees because now they have less stuff that they have to now um, bring to the landfill. So it really is a, a, a we, we always call it a win 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 because you know it's it supports um, our dining managers. It supports our students because they are um, not only doing this work and really understanding and immediately making an impact. They're also um, developing their leadership skills. They're running a little mini organization on their college campus. So all the benefits that go through there, you should talk to Shira about it because she and her Claremont crew, um, they're doing it every day. Um, it also benefits our communities because, you know, again, it's this really amazing food that is high quality food, um, getting to the people who need it. If there's going to be surplus, and we're all human, 
<laughs> there's going to be surplus, then it can benefit our community. So, um, yeah. I mean, on just building culture around that. You know, one of the, the early phases of Food Trace uh, several years back was a, a juice bar that I uh, co-founded with a family member. And we were wasting probably a million pounds of produce um, yearly. Um, to, if you think about it, when you juice, many juice bars are probably wasting the same amount. That produce is only, they're probably only extracting less than 15% um, and, and turning it into a juice. And so what I wanted to do was figure out a way to get that produce back to the urban farms that we wanted to work with to, that were bringing that, that produce in. Um, and started mapping out exactly how often we could drop off to the urban farms in the area, making sure that uh, we have urban farms in the city that had uh, a great agricultural cycle, you know, had wonderful soil and were producing top quality produce. And so I wanted to make sure that when we're thinking about um, food waste, that we're also thinking about uh, where the end product can go. Um, and I love working with companies now um, and thinking about uh, how we can um, make candies that are made out of, uh, you know, processed uh, fruits and vegetables, how we can make uh, chips and baked goods and uh, there's so many ways to just stretch out the level of innovation and, the, the, and where the, the, the final product really grows. And, and I love to think about how uh, it can just really come back to a full circle. Yeah, and can I jump in on that? I mean, I think there's food waste on every single level, right? It, it happens all over the place. And, and there's some, you know, in, in our, we, we use a shared warehouse space in Jessup, Maryland. And uh, in this warehouse, they have a lot of exotic fruits that... They have, they, a lot of times they put in the seconds room like yellow mangoes that are perfectly ripe but you wouldn't see otherwise in a grocery store because how often can you go to a grocery store and actually pick out something that's right, right? They also, uh, grocery stores often t oftentimes buy things that are underripe just so they can sit on the shelf for you know, three to four days or maybe even a week. So a lot of times there's this perfectly ripe stuff that sits in a warehouse and we're working on a project to do that exact thing, right? To create uh, fruit chips or kale chips or making it into juices or somehow process it so it's not going to waste, right? Right now we're focusing on just raw, fresh agricultural products that we can ship to our consumers and they can process it, but that is just a, a, a fraction of the amount of, the vast amount of, of food and produce that's going to waste on a yearly basis. So that's something we're working on uh, right now. So we've got just a few minutes before we go to audience questions. And since the theme of this panel is innovation, I, I'd love to hear from each of you uh, your thoughts on where, what is the next phase of innovation that you really need to, to do your work that either you plan to innovate or you want someone else to innovate to kind of to tackle these issues? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, it's, it's two main things, right? One, uh, it's events like this. It's market education. Teaching people that surplus produce, there is absolutely nothing wrong with it, right? How many people would not eat an apple because it's too small? Nobody raised their hands. That's exactly, right? And that's, that, that's what we're trying to get the message across with Hungry Harvest is we are trying to reduce food waste and feed hungry families. We just happen to deliver produce, right? That's our mission. And the second, the second I think, is sustainability, right? Donations can only go so far. We need a sustainable model to reduce food waste and feed hungry families and, and, and really change the system. Because it's not, it's not just a problem that we're facing in, in terms of food distribution. It's a crisis. It has never been this bad where we have so much produce going to waste, so much food going to waste, and yet there are a sixth of our country are, are food insecure. It's ridiculous. Like, we can't sit idly by and, and just let this happen. And uh, I think it's, it's really about creating a sustainable model to make sure that there are multiple approaches to attacking that issue. You know, we, we were just, uh, a few speakers and I were just talking in the, in the back room about how complicated an issue that food waste is and how complicated an issue of, of that hunger is. It's not going to require a simple solution. It requires a, a, a really complicated solution. It's not something that, say, that one giant company can say, okay, we're going to tackle food waste, right? It requires collaboration across so many different fronts, the government and, and private businesses and nonprofits, that we all have to work together to solve this problem because it's our planet, right? There's going to be a billion more people, or I think there's going to be 8 billion people in, in, in 35 years, right, in 2050. How are we going to feed everybody if we're wasting almost half of everything we grow, right? This is not, a, it's not, a, it's not an issue anymore. It's a crisis. And it's something that we all have to do uh, to address in our daily lives. Okay, thanks. That's great. 
inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just feel really passionate no, about this. No, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and I, I do want to thank um, Danielle and, and the team of Food Tank for having all of us here um, to raise this issue because I, I agree with um, that, it, that it is a, a crisis. Um, so for, for us, I mean, we're, we're on almost 200 college campuses and there are over 3,000 college campuses across the country. So for, for me, um, there's still a lot of work to be done with our, our current model. And so one thing I would say is everybody here, where did you guys go to school? And do you have an FRN chapter? Uh, if you don't, please talk to me. Um, because this is a student-driven model, like I said, um, not only are we teaching the emerging leaders, um, that they immediately want to do something better with, with surplus food until we can reduce to zero. Um, but in the, in the meantime, when, when those um, college students graduate, they are in the workforce and they are the ones who are now already with that mindset um, solving other problems, whether it is in the food system, whether it's in technology, um, whether it's in engineering, in nursing. Uh, there, there's so much potential for the thousands and thousands of students who already have this hardwired into how they work. So I'm gonna say, you know, let's keep growing this student movement and let's keep recovering from our restaurants, events like this, and just make that the national standard that we certify, say yes, if I'm gonna have an event, I know exactly where all my surplus food is going to go, and let's make that the standard. Great, thank you. Um, so start those chapters. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about the scale of the problem, the scope, the, the, the nature of the problem, and a, an approach to solving the problem because I don't have a solution to the problem. Um, the scale of the problem is that uh, Secretary Vilsack wants us to reduce our overpurchasing and underconsumption by 50% in 30 years, uh, 15 years, which means that he wants $250 billion in economic activity to disappear from America. That's, that's difficult. Uh, it, we need to innovate very, very quickly in order to find a place for that economic activity to go. Some of the people here are, are, have some great ideas about it. The, the nature of the problem is that waste and hunger are two different things. Uh, and the, in order to intervene in the food supply chain, uh, you, you've got to intervene at scale. So cherry picking just the food that you want as a charity doesn't really work. So you need partners in there who can also make those kale chips, who can optimize the supply chains, who can uh, tell you where the charities are to go. And you know, all that technology is cheap these days. It's not even interesting. You know, Uber's done it, Instacart's done it. Uh, at this point, we're just looking for use cases. Uh, the approach is, because of this new tax law uh, and some simplification, and Congresswoman uh, Pingree has some great ideas uh, if that bill goes anywhere, and she probably needs your support for that. Um, if we just recover 15% of the food that's wasted, um, we can generate $400, $500 million in tax deductions for food companies. Under our model, that provides $50 million a year to invest in businesses and to invest in charities. You know, it takes a lot of, you know, one of our advisors and, and uh, a member of the board of Food Cowboy Foundation, our charitable arm, is a retired Marine Corps general who ran a, a provisioning battalion in Okinawa and then went to run the Chicago Food Bank. And he said, you know, logistics is about culture. It's not about warehouses. It's not about apps. It's, it's about culture. And changing culture takes time. But I'm figuring $50 million a year for 10 years, we can, we can create some change. <laughs> and that's what the No Food Waste uh, Promise Alliance is all about. Look for the food cowboy wherever you buy food. Well, I'd have to say that uh, first I would uh, separate out food waste, food that goes to waste that is good for you, and food that goes to waste that's bad for you. And I'll focus on the good for you part, because I think that one of the ways that, uh, one of the areas we need to see more innovation is likely to be driven from the healthcare sector. Uh, I think hunger is going to be increasingly understood as a health issue. And part of the reason why, uh, for instance, uh, uh, fruits and vegetables in the field get thrown away is because it's not economical to harvest them to bring them to a market someplace, whether that's to a food bank or elsewhere. Uh, but if there was an ability to pay more money for them, uh, then fewer of them would be wasted. And the healthcare sector right now is really focused on the uh, costs that the processed food makers get to externalize because their products are causing health issues that are costing our society uh, over $100 billion a year. 
And if you can uh, put somebody who has hypertension or diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, on a healthy diet, uh, you can reduce the amount of health care services you need to provide to them just by enabling them to eat healthier food. Patrick, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you because we got to go to questions from the audience. Oh, now. sure. Yep, sure. but they're going to be around, so you can definitely follow up with them. Questions? Yep. I see two back there. Okay. side of that coin, right? Is um, we've got so much, it's much less expensive. We were discussing, some of us have lived in Europe and you know, people spend much higher percentage of their disposable income on food in almost every other country. So you know, part of it's gonna be a policy thing. I think we have to incentivize the outcome we want. And I so love that Food Tank had this discussion because we have to knit everything together from across the day. Because um, it, it, the nutrition, part of it is when we start understanding foods that are nutrient dense and we start incentivizing that in the supply chain, optimizing the supply chain, and putting policies in place that encourage not having as much cheap food as possible, but having enough nutrient dense food, we will get a different outcome. You know, so we really have to be outcome focused. You know, I find so much in, in life in general, in my food bank and, and in, throughout this day, we get stuck on the process. But I think we really need to be deliberately outcome focused on having enough nutrient dense food. There's so much smart work, so many cool people we've seen today doing all this great stuff. If we set the right goals um, and then we, we have the policies that drive at them. I think we'll have a chance. And if I can put a uh, shameless plug in there, sign up for Hungry Harvest as well. <laughs> Another question? Yep, over here. Uh, hi, this is a fantastic panel. I have a quick question. Uh, I'm Rodney North from Fair Trade America, and we partner with uh, tens of thousands of farms across 80 countries in the global south. And as you can imagine, some of them really struggle with on the farm food waste. You can imagine very remote areas with poor infrastructure, et cetera. So can you tell us about any of your peers who may be doing some similar work for tackling that problem, but in the global south? Thank you. Food, food waste in the developing world is, is not about consumer behavior or it's more about uh, power systems and roads getting food from the farms to, to where the people need to be. Uh, you know, not everywhere has this, our, our, our tax regime. Uh, and, and we spend billions of dollars through IMF and World Fund, uh, World Bank. Um, I don't know how much of that really gets deployed in, a, in, a, in ways that close that logistics gap between the people in the cities who need the food, that's where everyone's going, and uh, that's out there in the, uh, the food that's out there in the market. But that's all I got. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, it, it takes more um, growth around retail innovation, um, selling. Uh, there's a lot of studies that have, have been done now with um, sub-Saharan Africa and how they don't, uh, how each country does not sell to each other. Um, a lot of the food goes out to Europe and out, out to Asia or comes back in from these other continents. And so uh, thinking about ways to keep the uh, food system as local as possible uh, in the global south is, is is one is one area, and you know, we've we've also found that bringing things like juice bars, um, which which a lot of the cultures love, is is a way to keep that that produce local and, and innovating around um, the the growing populations in these areas and how they they want to have uh, retail and food options that uh, mimic a lot of uh, other countries that are doing those things well. 
There was a question. Hi, um, I'm Bettina Siegel, and I write the lunch tray. And um, very regularly, I'm contacted by parents who see in school cafeterias um, children are served like temperature stable sealed wrapped food or whole fruits like bananas, apples, oranges that they don't want. And those parents would like to donate them to a food bank or to a church or whatever. And the food bank or the church is happy to take it even though it has been placed on a, on a child's tray. But they run into local ordinances which prevent um, the donation of previously served food. You know, understandably, we don't want restaurants scraping people's plates and donating it. So I know there are like sharing tables and other informal things going on in cafeterias, but do you know of any municipalities that have kind of created a carve out for that situation? Because there is a lot of, you know, completely, uh, you know, as I said, stable, donatable food that I think people would like to donate and are unable to do so. Well, sometimes, yes, it's a really important point. You know, sometimes there are restrictions on the federal side or the government side that won't permit the, the person who, you know, has the food to give it. And there we don't have so much control. But there are interesting groups trying to work on this. Nourish Now is one in Montgomery County that is willing to go and pick up food that is able by law to be donated and will deliver it to directly to places who can use it. And it is true what you were saying about Uber and others are, are helping in the logistical supply chain. We piloted something with Uber, and we're very interested in picking up these small donations. Um, part of it is, though, you know, some food safety regulations sometimes might be a hair too far reaching. And so, again, you know, it would be a policy solution. Can I just, oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to jump in real quick to that. I, I've talked to um, other folks who, who face similar. <laughs> Um, uh, challenges like that and um, you know one thing that I, I would say actually um, an innovation that I that I heard about that might get to that uh, is that kids actually do want to eat those kinds of things you just got to cut the apples up because a lot of times they have braces and they're all like all this stuff it's just really hard to eat <laughs> so you know if we can slow down the, the food that's being um, brought to our, our kids that I think that would that would cut down a lot of um, the, the problem in the first place, and ask them if they want an apple. Um, if they don't, then, I mean, they weren't going to eat it in the first place, so, but. Um, Congresswoman Pingree's bill would rationalize the, uh, the, the food safety laws. It would allow donors to be protected uh, without having to comply with the, uh, the <laughs> It wasn't me. <laughs> the level without having to comply with county level regulations. Also, the Orange County, California uh, Health Authority sends its uh, restaurant inspectors out with information about donating food safely. You know, maybe they bump it up to the, to the school level. To respond, because um, please see me afterwards, Fairfax, Virginia, one of the largest school systems in the nation. Um, and I think you just referenced Congressman Wolf's legislation, but um, working with that, they actually have a model program, a template, a lot of local involvement needed, but um, between school and local pantries where milk, milk cartons, fruit, et cetera, just what you're talking about is taken and then used. Everybody's hearts racing. I know. <laughs> we're, we're awake. <laughs> right. The tax credits that you, oh, sorry, Sky Cornell from Wholesome Wave. Uh, the tax credits that you mentioned, what are the types of institutions? Are there limits to the types of institutions that can take advantage of those credits? Can Not you talk anymore. about that a little more? Yeah, uh, now all institutions can, can take advantage of it. It used to be just C Corps permanently, uh, but the bill broadened the application of the, of the bill, uh, of, of the tax, tax deductions. So it's, it's a lot simpler. It's section 170E3A of the tax code. If you go to our website, foodcowboy.com, you, you can see it. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Rihanna, you didn't get a chance to talk about innovation, innovation you'd like to see, nor did Nancy, so we got, you've got three and a half minutes. Um, you know, I was really going to go off of what you said around, um, you know, comparing good food uh, that's wasted to, to bad food that's wasted. We really have to think about um, what, what does bad food 
uh, due to the system. You know, we spend over $300 billion a year, the United States, on diabetes and obesity. And um, I, I really think that, as I, I mentioned earlier, we have to find ways to um, make sure that, as a culture, we're, we're thinking about um, waste in different ways. Waste, we're wasting our bodies and we're wasting people's um, time at work for uh, being ill. And so uh, food waste has like such far-reaching implications. Um, and, and really just uh, supporting companies, uh, buying from companies that are innovating around good products, around uh, smaller supply chains, around, um, you know, I, I think of the company Epic, uh, Epic Foods, uh, they have a new campaign uh, that's focused on using the entire, um, the, the entire, uh, I guess you would say, meat, if you will. So they're going from um, the entire animal, they're going from using, they're using bone broth, now they're, they're selling uh, jerky, every single part of the cow or of the buffalo that they can to get onto store shelves. And so just supporting companies that are innovating like crazy, small companies. And um, I, I love building tech that can help them grow and, and, and you know, continue to flourish in this economy. OK, Nancy, you've got a minute and 40 well, seconds. <clears throat> well. Two things. I think one is um, engaging everybody in the socioeconomic pyramid. Um, food waste is not just an issue for the middle and upper class. But so part of what we need to do is help teach even um, uh, you know the people that we're serving, no matter how hungry they might be. We've gotten so disconnected from our food supply that people don't know that an onion that has a bad spot on the outside that you can peel off that ring of the onion and use the perfectly good onion underneath. So there's some education with the public. Um, but I do think probably the biggest thing systemically as a society is to raise awareness, not just about those moldy strawberries at the very end of the line, but upstream how much processed, refined snack food is in the system. Get a dialogue going about that so that we can begin to address it because I agree so much with what you were saying about preventing diabetes um, and, and um, you know, hunger as a healthcare issue. Um, last thing, Giant Foods um, is modeling with us retailers for wellness because we went to them and I think, a lot of people think, oh, you don't wanna get, you know, the big companies involved. I have find that found them to be very willing. You know, Gordon Reed, uh, under his leadership, we're really modeling retailers for wellness where we're gonna try to sort out the bad and give the good. And I think if we can talk about it and raise awareness of the problem, there's a real willingness to fix it. And, and that's a big piece of it. Thank you so much. Perfect timing. Well that's awesome. <laughs>Thank Eliza and our panelists. This was a really, really instructive panel, and I think we all learned a lot from it. I want us to remember what the NRDC campaign said, that when we waste food, we waste everything, water, fuel, land, and love, as we go out to eat tonight or to pick up uh, dinner at, at the grocery store. Thank you all again. Thank you.